On November 30th, in the year 1896, a sea creature washed ashore dead on the shores of St. Augustine, Florida. And this creature had a round, ball-shaped body and the stumps of eight tentacles sticking out. Now, we have some children who are here this afternoon. Can any one of our children tell us what animal that lives in the sea has a round body and eight tentacles? Can anybody tell us? Just raise your hand if you know. Yeah? An octopus, of course. Boy, that wasn't so hard. Very simple. There was only one thing different about this octopus. The tentacles were 18 inches in diameter, which is about this big. The stump of the longest tentacle left was 23 feet long. And they estimated that when this creature was alive, his tentacles were about 75 feet long, giving it a span from tip to tip of 200 feet. That's two football fields long. And they estimated the weight of this animal of around five tons. Obviously, we have a giant octopus here. No question about that. Now, sailors for centuries had told stories about the giant octopus coming on up out of the deep and attacking ships and pulling them down, but they were usually just dismissed as the mad ravings of people who've been at sea for too long. Well, some scientists came down to check this thing out, and sadly, a few days later, it washed out back to sea again, so they didn't have a chance to preserve it. But they looked at it, and they found everything that we just mentioned about the whole thing. And there was something strange about scientists in those days, the end of the 19th century. They were kind of very much afraid to admit that they found some mystical, mythical creature, that it really lives. Because if they did that, and especially without the body to show people, well, they would lose their credibility. So they were afraid to admit that this was a giant octopus. So they tried to find some other way to explain what this creature was. So they said right away, oh, well, it must be a giant squid, which had always been a mythical creature until 150 of them washed ashore dead uh, on the shores of Newfoundland. And people finally had to admit that, oh, all right, I guess the giant squid does exist. And we have a name for it today, Architeuthyx ducks. So they said, well, this was a giant squid, except for the fact that the animal that was there clearly had a round body, and a squid has an arrow-shaped body and 10 tentacles, not eight. So that didn't work. And they looked for everything else they could possibly decide to call this thing that washed ashore. And there was nothing that fit the description. But they were still afraid to admit that they had found a giant octopus. So the report that these scientists gave of this creature with a round body and eight tentacles weighing about five tons that washed ashore on St. Augustine, Florida that day in 1896 was the carcass of a whale. A whale with tentacles? When was the last time anyone saw a whale with tentacles? You have to look at these men and say, come on, why can't you believe that the, uh, the giant octopus exists? You've got five tons of it reeking in the hot Florida sun. Why can't you believe what you see right before your eyes? What are you, blind? The Jews for centuries had been longing and praying for the promised Messiah. And the prophets and the Psalms all talked about what the Messiah was going to do when he came. And Sabbath after Sabbath, in their synagogues, they prayed, Lord, send us the Messiah. And finally, Jesus, the Messiah, came along and fulfilled every single prophecy that was written about him. And people were coming back to the Lord. Sinners were leaving their sins behind. Jesus was performing miracles. Every sign was there that Jesus was the Messiah. And the Pharisees and the chief priests rejected it. They said, nah, he can't be the Messiah. And the question we want to ask them is, why can't you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? He's fulfilling everything that was promised about him. People are turning back to God. He's working miracles. The world is alive again with him. Why can't you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? What are you, blind? Not physically, but spiritually. They were afraid of the ramifications of admitting that Jesus was the Messiah. Just like those scientists who were afraid they would lose their credibility if they admitted that this was a giant octopus, they were afraid to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah because if they did, they would have to admit that they were wrong. Jesus had told them they had made mistakes. They did not get certain things right, and they'd have to change their mind. And for many people, to admit they're wrong is the hardest thing for them to do. 
Those of you who are my age or older will certainly remember the sitcom Happy Days and the character Fonzie. And do you remember the episode where Fonzie, it was proven to him that he had done something wrong and he had to apologize. And so he's standing in front of a whole bunch of people and goes, I'm sorry, I was... I was... I was... He could not say I was wrong. And for so many people, that's their biggest obstacle. The biggest stumbling block to following the Lord is changing their mind and listening to God tell us what he says is right and wrong and not follow what we think is right and wrong. You see, a lot of times we come before the Lord and we're supposed to say, you know, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. But in our prayer, it turns out we're actually saying, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. And we're not saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? But we come to the Lord in our prayer and in our lives saying, Lord, this is what I want you to do. And I will only follow you and believe in you when you do things my way, when you do what I want you to do. And so many people, for them to come to faith, it's a stumbling block because they will not change their mind. They will not leave their preconceived notions. They have too much baggage that they held on to. And the Pharisees were like that. Whereas the man born blind didn't have any of that. He had no preconceived notions. He met Jesus as he was. And we see in this beautiful encounter how the man born blind starts in blindness and ends up in total sight. And the Pharisees is completely the opposite. They're going in the other direction as this man is growing in his, his vision of the Lord. We I mean, look first when, when Jesus heals the man. They, they ask him, Yo, who healed you? That man they call Jesus. That's the first thing he says about him. Then afterwards, he says he is a prophet. Then he starts defending Jesus when they said he could has to be a sinner. He goes, I don't know if he's a sinner. I only know I was blind and now I can see. And when they questioned him again, he says, I told you already what he did. Why do you have to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples? And of course, they retorted back at him, we're disciples of Moses. We don't know where this guy's from. And then the blind man very boldly says, well, this is news. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. It's unheard of that anyone has ever did anything like this. If he were not from God, he couldn't do such a thing. And then when he meets Jesus again, Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? He goes, I who speak to you am he. And he says, I do believe, Lord, and he worships him. He's come from blindness to complete sight. And the Pharisees, they start out in the beginning questioning, you know, was this man really born blind? Is it really the guy that they'd seen sitting there? Then they said, oh, no, it's just somebody who looks like him. No, well, of course, that didn't work. He says, no, I'm really the guy. Okay, how did he heal you? They talked about he made mud. Well, he can't be from God because he made mud and healed him on the Sabbath, which they decided was work that violated the Sabbath. But others disagreed. So then they found his parents and tried to say, you know, still question that this man was truly the man born blind. And the parents said, yeah, he really is. So then they question the man again. And when he doesn't give them an answer that they like and he starts defending Jesus, they turn to him and resort to the oldest trick in the book. They bully him. What? You're steeped in sin from your birth and you dare to give us lectures? And they threw him out. And then, of course, when they stand before Jesus again and he talks about the blind seeing and the seeing become blind, they say, oh, you're not saying that we are blind. And Jesus had said, if you were blind, there would be no sin in that. But since you say you see, your sin remains. And their blindness would become complete at Jesus' trial when he stood before Pontius Pilate and Pilate says to them, he's trying to release Jesus, says, behold your king. And the chief priest cries out, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. That's blasphemy. He should have said we have no king but God. But he blasphemed the Lord in public even before the Roman procurator. And when we look at Jesus' trial, we realize every single crime that they falsely accused Jesus of committing, they themselves committed during Jesus' trial. So they went totally into blindness. And the message for us today is very simple, to see if we can drop our preconceived notions and the baggage that so many times we hold on to. We all know many people who will refuse to follow the Lord until the church changes this teaching or that. And of course, we're here, so obviously that doesn't affect us. 
But sometimes even in our own hearts, our own prayer, we still find a struggle with God because God's not giving us what we want him to give us. And we pray for it and pray for it. And it's still not happening. We might shake our fists and say, God, what more do I have to do? Why won't you give this to me? We still have our own notions of what God should be doing for us. And as long as we go to God with our list of demands, saying he's got to do this and that, he will forever be a stumbling block for us. Whereas we go to him with open hearts and open ears and open minds and just let the Lord speak to us, then, like the blind man, we will come to sight because we'll be hearing God on his own terms and be able to accept him and appreciate what he's doing for us where so many other people fail. My dear friends who were with us today for our second scrutiny of the RCIA, you are here today because somebody or somehow something brought you here before the Lord, and you apparently do not have that uh, tragedy, shall we say, or that hindrance of preconceived notions and baggage. You've come here with fresh ears, and you're being able to accept Jesus on his terms, And that is a good sign for all the rest of us, that you have seen with all the different things in the world that people tell us is the truth. You have come to realize, no, it is not what the world says that is truth. Christ is the truth, what he teaches us through his church. And I want him in my life, and I want to be part of the church that he founded. Be, please, always an example for everyone else, for all of us, of what it means to leave behind all of our baggage and be able to follow Jesus and listen to him. Because if you can help all of us to see that, then we, and we give, you help us find the grace in the Lord to leave our other ideas behind and see the Lord as he is and allow him to do for us, us what he wants to do for us, then we'll be able to speak of that grace, that amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now I see. May Jesus Christ be praised, now and forever.